Before the pandemic shut down, I booked a North to South Alaska cruise on Princess Cruises from Whittier near Anchorage to Vancouver. First, because I thought the itinerary would be better than the inside passage I'd done previously, and Princess claimed to be an Alaska expert. I did finally do that trip this year, and neither of those assumptions turned out as expected. I knew it was a different world to when I booked and would be a different experience, but I didn't appreciate quite as many differences and surprises. One of which was coming back from Alaska with more than memories, a souvenir unique to this time, COVID. I am Gary Bembridge, and I want to talk about the good things and bad things about cruising Alaska and on Princess these days. The trip started with an unexpected highlight, thanks to embarking the ship in Whittier. As the trip got closer, I thought it was a really bad idea choosing this itinerary, as I discovered that Whittier was not easy to get to. But my travel agent, Sarah Bolton, suggested the Glacier Discovery train that runs from Anchorage down to Whittier. It's about a two and a half hour train ride through the most phenomenal scenery. It was a brilliant way of setting the scene and seeing parts of Alaska that I wouldn't see on the cruise. And the train arrived right next to the ship in Whittier. I checked my baggage into the train station in Anchorage and they told me the next time I would see it would be in my cabin. However, what they didn't tell me is that it doesn't travel with the train. They hold all of the bags there and it comes down when the other cruise line trains run late in the day. I was actually getting really stressed because by 6.30 p.m., despite arriving at noon, I had no bags. I finally got them just before seven. Checking in at Whittier, though, was an absolute breeze, so much better than my last trip embarking in Vancouver. I was on the ship within a couple of minutes of leaving the train. There were some unexpected upsides and pluses also cruising Alaska right now. First, although ports were busy, as most ships like ours were selling below capacity, none of the ports were as packed as on my last trip. We had four ships in Skagway, six ships in Juneau, and five in Ketchikan. That should have meant over 15,000 plus passengers on those days, but it was not crazy busy. It was noticeably less busy wandering around and when I was out on excursions. Though the even bigger plus for me was the itinerary I chose. I did find it much better than my Inside Passage one. I got further north to see the Hubbard Glacier. It was an incredible, incredible experience. Adding to that was I booked a cruise line offered boat excursion off the ship. This boat met us as we sailed into Yakutat Bay and took 150 of us right up close to the glacier. We saw many incredible carving events. The people on the ship didn't get that close and didn't see what we saw. Glacier Bay was another big highlight, as I mentioned. The Marjorie Glacier itself was worth it, but I did see several other glaciers. It is the most beautiful, memorable experience. And with all that expertise from the rangers, it really was a phenomenal day. Skagway, for me, was another massive highlight. I went again on the White Pass and Yukon train. This is a historical train built for the gold rush. It is an incredible excursion right up into the mountains, about two and a half hours there and back. In Juneau, I did a helicopter ride to walk on the Mendenhall Glacier. It was worth the $360. The time before, I'd gone dog sledding on the Norris Glacier, which wasn't offered this time. But doing the helicopter ride and getting above glaciers was worth every cent that I coughed up. Also in Juneau, I went up the Gold Belt Tramway up Mount Roberts. This is a thrilling experience, not very expensive to do, and you get a phenomenal view of the area and all of those ships in port. In Ketchikan, I went again to the Great Alaska Lumberjack Show, which is always great fun. I went to the famous Creek Street, which is fantastic, although it did feel a bit more tacky visiting it again. The town, of course, is very commercial and a bit of a tourist trap in reality. Throughout this trip, I was reminded that Alaska, though, is still magnificent. The sites are just as impressive and as memorable. Although there were, unfortunately, quite a few businesses that were closed and shuttered up still that hopefully will re-emerge, I need to talk about Princess and the ship as it was very much a mixed bag. Between booking the trip years ago and going, I'd gone off Princess a bit after my Regal and Sky Princess trips last year, where food 
and service were pretty average. I'd booked an itinerary on Majestic Princess, not clicking that the ship had been designed for the Asian market and I'd had several people messaging me saying, I'm not sure you'll like the ship. To add to my princess reticence, I was not having much joy with the much touted princess technology and their app. I kept getting messages before the cruise saying I had to reserve my check-in time, but the app wouldn't let me. It also kept changing from saying I'd submitted everything required to board to saying that I hadn't. The app never got much better. It kept telling me, for example, I hadn't paid fully for my cruise once I was on the ship, so I couldn't book dining times, which we were supposed to do. Eventually, I gave up on the app and used the big interactive screens dotted around the ship, which actually worked really well. My cabin I loved and the ship itself I was fine with, but there are a few things that did strike me as not ideal. On boarding, it did have one thing I think is a pity across the princess fleet, and that's the sense of sameness. The ships basically all look the same. The decor, the layout, they don't each have a unique character to them. So while there is a huge advantage that I knew my way around and where everything was, it lacked the excitement for me anyway of exploring a slightly different ship. One thing many love is the focus of a princess ship is on that atrium across three decks. So if I wanted a buzz, find stuff going on and access to most things, it was here. There was the international cafe, restaurants, bars, shops, photo center, and so on. But as great as the atrium is, I find it very inward looking. There are no big views out of the sea and the landscapes. This was a pity for Alaska, which is all about the outdoors and scenery. Another thing which was even mentioned by one of the Alaska enrichment lecturers is Majestic Princess is possibly not the very best ship for scenic sailing and sightseeing in Alaska. Unlike the Holland American New Amsterdam on my last trip, the ship layout means they can't open the bow when scenic cruising takes place in Glacier Bay or places like that, nor does it have a fully wraparound and covered promenade deck. So if the weather's not great, which it often isn't in Alaska, there were few covered spaces to do viewing. Now this didn't affect my trip as we had no rain and not too much wind on our scenic cruising days. I was able to have great viewing on the open promenade spaces up on deck 7 and high up on deck 17 above the pool deck as we had fine weather. But if it had been raining, it definitely wouldn't have been ideal. So in Glacier Bay, when the weather turned later in the day, many people headed up to the Hollywood Conservatory, an indoor space with large glass windows because that was the best and most protected alternative. Now I booked a mini suite balcony cabin which I found really comfy and it also ended up being a great place to do sightseeing because the captain alternated which side of the ship faced glaciers when we stopped for viewing. I didn't think any of the differences in Majestic Princess being designed for the Asian market were an issue or actually really stood out. All the signs of course had both English and Chinese. There was the Harmony restaurant instead of Sabatini's the Italian which I was actually really excited about because I love Asian food. The food though I felt was pretty average and I'd booked to go more than once but cancelled my repeat trips. They had things like a noodle bar, the casino was huge, they even had a VIP casino area which for us in the west and on our trip was operating just as a lounge. The Hollywood Conservatory I mentioned earlier on other princess ships is the sanctuary but it was more designed with seating and for game playing than lying around on lounges but importantly it was free unlike the sanctuary which normally has a fee to use. I found the food and the service fine across the trip, neither exceptional nor bad, certainly for the premium category they operate in. It's probably a tad less than I had on recent trips on Celebrity, Holland America and even Virgin Voyages which are the other bigger players in the category, the premium category anyway. One thing I felt is the menu choices felt smaller than I remember and certainly versus the other lines. And this was something other passengers I spoke to also commented on. There is though a range of choice on the menus. There were some little touches that are important to me missing versus the other premium lines that you may think are important. But for example, they didn't have any diet and caffeine free drinks on the ship. Now I don't drink alcohol, caffeine and sugary drinks, but I love sodas. Now, unlike other premium lines, including Holland America and Celebrity, they didn't have, for example, a Diet 7 or Sprite 
option for me, a diet sprite option. They didn't have caffeine-free diet coke and so on. So my options were just water and juices. It's a smallish point, but as a premium line, having such a reduced and small choice and smaller menu choices kind of stood out a little bit to me. One thing though that really stood out is the passenger mix. People go to Alaska because they want to go there and seem much less focused on what any specific line offers or is positioned as doing. On Majestic Princess, there were 2,260 passengers on the ship, which is around about 60% capacity. It was a very different passenger mix to I normally find on Princess Cruises. There were many multi-generational families traveling together and lots of families. On both sides of my cabin were, for example, families of four. The mix difference showed up in things like the fitness center, much busier than usual, and boisterous kids took over the indoor Hollywood pool most days. The usual dress code was also thrown out of the window. It was almost impossible to tell when it was formal night versus the everyday smart casual nights. I would estimate probably less than a quarter of people optimistically dressed differently on formal night. I literally saw one person in a tux and they looked uncomfortable because they were so dressed up versus everybody else. One big plus I would say about Princess is they did try to immerse me into Alaska. There were many touches on board which I thought were really good. They had two naturalists and region experts, Mark Harris and Rachel Moreno, who spent five months of the season on board and they gave excellent and really entertaining talks throughout the trip. The entertainment team wore lumberjack style shirts. There was a lot of high quality Alaskan merchandise in both the shops and out on the deck. There were several books on the region and a couple of specific books, including one about the cruise that the captain would refer to each day. We went into Glacier Bay, which is a huge plus as only two large cruise ships are allowed in each day and only them, Holland America and some Norwegian ships usually have access. That is a big plus. On that particular day, they brought three Glacier Bay National Park Rangers on board. One called Ethan gave a moving talk about the indigenous community and they then ran commentary all day. They ran an information and merchandise counter all day too. Now I was warned by the cruise line that COVID was an issue in the region and we should take care. Although we did have masks on board, some distancing and none of the big group events were held once out about on land, that of course was not the case in Alaska. So when I got back home, I did a test as several people I'd spoken to coming back from my cruise and other Alaskan cruises had tested positive. I tested positive too. Now I assume I picked it up and had it on the trip because it only took about three or four days before I started testing negative once I was home. And I felt fine, surprisingly, through all of this. The memories and the experience made this trip, despite that, one of my most memorable ever. I'm not sure if I would go back on Princess to Alaska. They did get me to the places, the sites, they offered the excursions I needed, they did great immersion, so time will tell who I decide to go back with. If you want detailed tips on visiting Alaska though, watch this video with my tips on how to plan and make the most of Alaska, starting with the single most important thing that determines whether you'll have a great time there. See you over there.